living la vida loca. This show is changing lives. We talking about your diet, trying to get you feeling right. Cut up them avocados, fry some eggs. Time to explore the longest running health podcast, hosted by Jimmy Moore. Time to give up the crappy garbage. We're getting into ketosis. Every day is a new step to your goal. Yeah, you're getting closer. Motivated and focused. Don't stop, just go. Time to get inspiration from the Living La Vida Low Carb Show. Hey, the Living Low Carb Show dot com. Guys, that right there is McKay Rippy. He is McKay does acupuncture. He is an acupuncturist. Uh, duh. Uh, but more than that, you're into health uh, in a lot of ways, not just with what you do with acupuncture, which, by the way, I had never done acupuncture, McKay. I was on a cruise ship, I want to say like three years ago, and I was having some pain in my body. And uh, and they said, well, we have acupuncture, because they also had a massage therapist, but they said, we have acupuncturist on board. I'm like, oh, really? I've always wanted to do that. So I had all the needles stuck in my back and all that stuff. And damn, if it didn't work, I was like, whoa. I'm like, not that I... Not that I doubted that it worked. It's just, it's kind of like chiropractic. It gets made fun of, but it's actually a real modality for healing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years, and there's still times when I think, how did that happen? Yeah. And it is, it is also one of those things where I had a patient once. We'd finally gotten a little bit of rapport going back and forth. She'd come in a bunch of times. She said, you know, McKay, acupuncture is a lot like cannibalism. I said, what are you talking about? Are you nuts? And she says, no, hear me out. He said, everybody's heard of it, but nobody does it. <laughs> so I'm glad you got a chance to try it out. Well, the hard part is, I don't know. I know you know, because there's probably associations that group all you guys and have all your information about how to find you. But it's not as ubiquitous as even a chiropractor. You can find chiropractors on every corner. Acupuncturists? You got to really look. Yeah, we're, we're still pretty rare. And it's a skill. It's like being a surgeon. It's not, you know, you can't, you can't practice out of a textbook. You have to get experience. You have to go through the trials and tribulations of figuring out what works and what doesn't work. Even after you've been to school, right? biochemical individuality people are different and you think you think i remember i remember learning ear acupuncture to do detox in prison work volunteer in prison work and they gave you the chart you you know you took the little written test and everything to get certified and there was time to do the practical and we paired up and so i had to practice on somebody else and i sat down next to the person to have them turn their head to the side a little bit and i looked at that ear and I looked at the year on the picture, the chart, and I looked back at that. They looked nothing like each other. And I raised my hand and said, help me. <laughs> right. No. And, and so now that I've done thousands, thousands of years, it's like it's no problem. But that's, you know, that's just one of those things. So the bottom line on that story, I guess what, what I'm trying to lead to with this is for an acupuncturist, talk to your friends. Find out who's yeah. worked for them. Yeah. Do it through networking. Even credentialing yeah. doesn't mean a whole lot uh, with that. Just just like with any doctor, do you, do your homework. They're, they're around there. We're, we're hidden under rocks and in dark corners in most places. <laughs> so, guys, I actually interviewed McKay. He was one of my early, early podcast guests uh, on the Live in La Vida Low Carb Show, which I'm approaching 1,800 episodes on that show mckay when you were on i want to say i want to say you were 300 something it was it was a long time ago back when we both had more hair <laughs> yeah yeah had a whole lot more hair <laughs> yeah. and a few less grays yeah, but, that too. but i recently reconnected with you um online when i put out this call hey you want to be on the on the show got something interesting and you had a, a great topic then i actually got to see you at the biohacking conference a few weeks back, uh, Dave Asprey's conference, yeah. you were representing this company. Uh, tell tell them about that that blood sugar device. I know you have it nearby. So blood blood pressure device. Oh, blood pressure. Sorry, I, that, I'm sorry. Thank you. So yeah, this is the Zona. It's a great little device. Bottom line is, it trains your cardiovascular system to relax 
And in about six to eight weeks, I can't say what it does, but your blood pressure changes. Yes. So guys, it's actually all you do is just squeeze. It. They get a baseline reading and then it leads you where you squeeze again and you've got to hold it not too tight, not too soft in that range of what your, your tight grip is. I did it at the conference and I was like, whoa, like this is a challenge. But if you did that over a period of time, it would lower your blood pressure. I actually need to buy one of those because I think it would be helpful. Uh, but I did something at the conference that blew your mind. <laughs> yes, yes, you did. And that is Jimmy, you should look up his, his if it's on your website, Jimmy grabbed two of the, two of the Zonas, one on each hand. And I've been doing these conferences for a while now. I've never seen anybody pick up two. And Jimmy's like, it just makes sense. And I thought about it. It does make sense, Jimmy, but nobody's ever done that before. It was both the grip uh, thing and then like hand-eye coordination because I had to like make sure which hand I was squeezing enough because one would be not enough, the other would be too much. You'd have to like bounce it out. But I got in the balance really fast, so I was, I was real pleased. Good eye hand coordination, Jimmy. Real pleased. But what he wanted to talk about here today, you guys, enough of the jibber-jabber with my bud, so um, is the future of medicine. Like, we're living in a weird world right now where mm -hmm. I think everything's kind of changing anyway, but the future of medicine as we know it ain't going to be go see a doctor for a chronic disease and yet again another get another pill or procedure. The future of medicine you say is more of an integrative approach, more of a functional approach, more of a underlying causes, more of a let's do some acupuncture, let's do some stress management, let's teach people maybe some biohacking techniques and things like that. Uh, tell us your premise as to why you think that is the future. Yeah, it's, I, we need medicine 2.0. Medicine 1.0 has pretty much run its course. And, you know, I heard your story about going to the urgent care center and yeah. how you just wanted to flip your lid about yeah. just your experience there. Let me tell people that don't know, because I've been doing a lot of Instagram lives with my statical to 50, but not everybody has seen that. So I had to go as of the recording of this last week to an urgent care clinic because there was a big bruise on my left calf and unknown just came out of nowhere. It came after the biohacking conference. So I'm like, I don't know. Did I kick it at the biohack? I don't know what happened. So I was doing a lot of biohacks. So who knows? But I get there two and a half hours later, get to finally see a nurse practitioner and looks at it and goes, oh, I don't know what it is, but let, let's make sure it's not a blood clot. And so I had to go down to uh, the hospital and get uh, ultrasound to make sure it wasn't a blood clot. It was not. $600 later, um, and, but they still didn't know what it was. Two days later, McKay, it disappeared. It's gone. It's healed. It's a little tender still, but nothing was wrong. And it's like, okay, did I need to go to that emergency clinic? Did I, did, what was that all about? And it would cost me a thousand bucks, that, that whole rigmarole. Right, and did, did you need to be treated the way you were being treated? So what, what I like to, th to think about is like, how do we get into this mess? We all know we're in a mess. Everybody knows that. Everybody inside the system, everybody outside of the system, everybody paying for the system, everybody who somebody else is paying for the system. It's just, it's an expensive mess. Now, it's also maybe one of the best messes in the world there it might be the best system in the world which isn't saying much it's kind of a sad state of affairs but we let, let, let me be real clear for acute care they're yes. fantastic if i break my arm if i have a laceration and need it sewed up i'm yes. going to see a doctor mainstream medicine doctor that's what they're good at it's the problem is people go to doctors for every ailment in the world which mostly are chronic disease related, metabolic related, dietary and lifestyle related, and they're not getting any help with those kinds of issues. And that's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let's go back to, to the beginning. Flor Florence Nightingale, who's, I, I read a biography about her, kind of doing my summer chores. I like to do books on tape kind of thing while I'm riding the lawnmower and tractor around. And fascinating woman. She came in during the Crimean War for the British and revolutionized healthcare. And she basically, it was like the Civil War. Nobody was dying on the battlefield. They're all dying in the hospital. 
And she went in there and said, oh, my goodness, this place is a wreck. You guys don't wash your hands. You don't feed them. It's gross. You don't even wash the sheets. You know, so she came in and literally just cleaned the place up. So this is back with Lister and Listerine. And yes. this is back with Semmelweis and washing the hands and germs, no germs and what's going on. So that was a miracle, right? So that's like medicine zero point whatever beta to medicine 1.0. And then, then we kind of move on and then we get – we get antibiotics in the beginning of antibiotics. And we get characters like, uh, like oh, I'm going blank on his first name, but uh, Dr. Koch around the turn of the century. And he's coins this term that's called magic bullet. It's like, and he, he created a cure for syphilis that also had mer mercury in it, right? So it wasn't, wasn't a great cure, but it was the best that we had. He won the Nobel Prize. The man won the Nobel Prize. And the idea, he, he got hooked up with men doing staining for mic microscopic staining on slides. And they found that certain stains mark certain parts of the cells or certain cells. And they're like, that's where we get the term gram-negative bacteria or gram-positive bacteria. Because certain stains would attach to the, the different types of bacteria. Yeah. And it was like, my God, if we could do this with a stain, we should be able to do this with some sort of medicine and just target precisely what we need to do and not touch anything else, right? It's the magic bullet. It's gonna find its way all the way through the body and only attack what needs to attack. It's like, and, and that thinking, we're stuck in that thinking. And this is why it doesn't work for chronic disease. So the magic thing you were, I heard you again, very recently talking about cholesterol, right? One of your favorite topics. It's a magic bullet. We're going to send the magic statin in there through the body da, 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 and attack the cholesterol and you're going to be healed. Except it don't work that way. To borrow a Southern phrase, it don't work that way. <laughs> right? That dog, that dog don't hunt. That well. dog don't hunt. There we go. Much better. Thank you very much. <laughs> I was born in D.C., so I'm neither a Southerner or a Northerner. I'm trapped in the middle somewhere. <laughs> You're stuck in the swamp there, yes. So. Yeah, I got out of the swamp. <laughs> so what what can we do to break the mold? Because it seems to me with mainstream medicine that the biggest problem is it's just a business model that's just not helping patients. The business model is predicated on come in, see them as quickly as possible so you can get to yeah. the next patient, have a quota number of patients, and then get them on medications because that gets you off the hook for liability because you're doing standard of care that says said disease with an ICD code, said drug that's supposed to fix said disease, boom, but then they don't get better. Yeah, we've got factory medicine, don't we? So in a factory, you've got your input, you've got your process, and then you got the output. And medicine, the, in, the, the, the raw materials is, is the patient. Let's yeah. be honest, right? You go into the system like you did at the urgent care, the clinics, the system, and the output, you think the output would be health? The output isn't health. What do, the, what do they get paid for? They get paid for generating an ICD code yep. or a prescription. Those are the outputs. That's what they care about. And it's not, you know, the doctors care. I'm not busting on doctors. It's the system they're in. If they yep. don't create those things, they don't get paid. Right. If you're not getting paid, you're not in business. You can't stay in business. So, so that's right. And that, so that's the third party trap we got into. So then somebody else is paying for it. So you're not paying for it yourself. So they want to get efficient. So you start putting factory ideas into a relationship based health, uh, the healthcare should be. And then, then we got into this really sticky wicket about 10 years ago where Medicare was paying slightly more for a hospital based operation, not operation, but even visits, like doctor visits, than they were the doctors themselves. So it became financially more attractive for doctors to get bought out by hospitals. Yeah. Where's the family doctor? They're, they're, they're lost in a Norman Rockwell painting. They're gone. They're just gone. Yeah. And it was all because of the finances. Yeah, they're not looking at the patient when no. they're talking to them. They're looking at a chart. And I haven't, sadly... I haven't been to go see a, a regular doctor. I had to fire mine circa six years ago, McKay, because yeah. I'd go in. And of course, I'm pretty educated on this stuff of what I want. 
I'm the patient uh, and I see a doctor as a consultant in my health, not the boss of my health. Most people don't. And I went in and, and it was a, a annual physical and I wanted specific numbers run. So when I saw the test he was going to run, I'm like, where's fasting insulin? They, it wasn't there. Where's HSCRP? I want to look at what my inflammation is. It wasn't there. They had key readings that I wanted to run and they they wouldn't run them. They flat out refused. They're like, well, we don't, you're not diabetic, so we can't run a fasting insulin. I'm like, right. yeah, I'm trying to keep it that way. I don't want to become diabetic. But they just didn't understand. They didn't grasp that I wanted that. And I said, well, okay, well, if insurance doesn't pay for it, you don't have an ICD code for that. How about I just pay out of pocket? I know insulin's like 50 bucks. And they still refuse. So I had to fire him. I'm like, why can't I get what I want as a patient trying to be proactive about my own health? Real Good Foods is one of the fastest growing frozen food companies in the U.S. Everything they make is nutrient dense, high in protein, low in carbs, and made from real food ingredients. They make food for every occasion, breakfast sandwiches, poppers, enchiladas, entrees, and pizza. So whether you're on a keto diet, trying to cut back on your carbs, or just trying to eat healthier, they make super convenient and tasty options. RealGoodFoods.com and at RealGoodFoods on social media. Because they're stuck, the mindset's stuck in the system, and we're, cre we're, we're humans. We're all creatures of habit, whether we like to or not, and their habit is to do things a certain way. Yeah. Now, again, if we kind of go on, I think we need to go back to the future, really, and they're, they're going to be they're going to be emergency rooms. They're going to be urgent care, and we're not going to go there for... Yeah for actual health care we're going to go there if we're sick if we need a test run if we you know I, we hurt our arm is it broken or not all that kind of stuff but it it used to be there was a, a community back again a community health care practitioner it was yeah. a doctor back then yes and may, who knows maybe a chiropractor this time maybe it's a naturopath maybe yeah. it's a functional medicine doctor but the the problem with the model that we have right now is if that practitioner just starts practicing like the urgent care center where the patient where they're just charging by the hour everybody gets the same thing it's widgetized you know it's industrialized you can't afford to stay in business i mean if there's a chiropractor that's been around for a while who's who's listening to this the insurance companies have put the squeeze on them like like nobody's business and the same has happened to other doctors the reimbursements just just aren't there so what used to happen think about it is you had the rich landowner owner right now he's going to pay more for his doctor visit than the washerwoman was in fact he probably if the washerwoman worked for him he'd be covering that himself we've got to get back to a sliding scale where people the, the one percent the two percent whatever it is in the community who can afford to pay more pay more to keep the person there and in business that allows everybody else to slide in underneath it. And so if, if you're a practitioner out there listening, you've got to create packages that the top 5% are happy to pay for, give them a little more access, give them a little more your time, whatever it is you need to do so you can afford to treat everybody else. Because otherwise you just raise the prices for everybody and then you leave behind 80% of the people. And that doesn't work for the entire community. And that's why practitioners feel funny about it and bad about it and don't like to talk about money but we need to go back to an old-fashioned pricing system rather than this factory widget based nonsense that we're we're stuck in we don't even know we're stuck in it because it's invisible i'm gonna date myself with this reference but remember the michael j fox movie doc hollywood where he yes. is an la doctor real fancy schmancy or new yorker one of the big cities and he ends up in this little podunk town and the old man that's the doctor there, because uh, his car breaks down, trying to help him with something. And so he tries to come in and help. He's this young, hot shot doctor. And then he ends up staying in the town, becoming their doctor, replacing the old man. But it was like people would pay him with a pig, because yep. that's all they could afford, yep. and, and that kind of thing. That's kind of lost in Americana now. That, that kind of doctor, maybe they still uh, still exist out there in small town America ish ish ish. No, no, come but, on, you're you're in South Carolina, but they would be outside of the insurance yes. program. 
Yeah. So right now, the docs that are outside of the insurance company, they're either the concierge docs. Yes. Right. Who are catering to, again, the top 5% only yeah. who can afford it. Or they're doctors treating things like Lyme disease and doing some alternative treatments that if they stayed in the system, they'd have their license stripped by by the insurance companies. Yes, like there's a, there's a guy here in South Carolina, I don't know if he's still in practice, but circa 10, 15 years ago, did chelation therapy. Yep. And because that's kind of an off the grid kind of treatment for heavy metals, um, he, he, he's like, I'm concierge, you have to pay out of pocket, but he'd work with you, you could pay over time, blah, blah, blah. But there are doctors, it's just the ones that get stuck in the system and, and then when they did the Affordable Care Act, that really made a lot of this kind of come uh, a, l a little more codified. They have to do this and this, and you have to report this to this, this to this, and it, and it made it a lot more complicated. Well, it's evident, it's evidence-based medicine, right? And evidence-based medicine was really supported by the insurance companies because they want control over their doctors. They want, they want full control over what's paid for and what's not. On, on one hand, you could, it, it makes sense if you have a, a very narrow conversation about it. It's like, you don't want a doctor just doing crazy stuff and writing prescriptions for stupid stuff, wasting money and sending everybody to everything. You don't want that. But on the other hand, it's gone way too, the pendulum swung way too far and they have zero control. They're not doing, there used to be in every town, a building called the Medical Arts Building, Medical Arts Right now it's, now it's a hospital. It's the medical robots building. It's the medical factory building. You, you know what's the problem here? A lot of patients don't know this information we're sharing here today because they think they go to see the doctor that the doctor's all knowing on all the things related to whatever general disease they have and their specialists, even the specialists are in on this. Even the specialists don't know all the things. I'm amazed, at, I'm amazed at how many oncologists that I've talked to that are supposed to be the people when it comes to cancer, and they have no idea that there's research out there looking at ketogenic diets, for example, helping to reduce the need for as much chemotherapy. You still need chemotherapy, but maybe not as much, maybe survivability after the chemo. There's just so many little nuances, and I talk to you know, mainstream oncologists, they don't know anything about that. And I'm like, there's studies. Are you not keeping up with the literature? And no, they're not. They're not. That's big. So the, the way their educate, their continuing education is done is through societies and through their professional, yeah. through their professional societies. And maybe they get subscribed to one journal or so. So it's curated for them. And yeah. God bless them. These are the busiest, most overworked stressed out people on the planet they make every they earn every penny they get paid it's not that they're bad people it's right. just that they're spoon fed a very limited diet let's just put it that way yes and at these conferences where they get cme credits continuing education uh, kind of credits um the funding for the talks is pharmaceutical companies like Again, the patient doesn't realize this. I only realized this, McKay, because back when I first met you many moons ago, over a decade ago, uh, Eric Westman and Jeff Folick and Steve Finney, and, and, and they would invite me to come to these obesity conferences to kind of hear the latest in obesity medicine. There were like keto kind of presentations. I'm like, okay, let's learn. And I was amazed at these mainstream obesity conferences of how many pharmaceutical companies bought time to pitch drugs to help with weight loss, to help with appetite, to help with this, help with that. Um, and it was heavy, heavy influence. Uh, and then the food they would serve, oh my gosh, like if you've ever been to a medical conference, guys, they've got, they've got cookies and candy and snacks. It's just, you just, it would make your eyes roll in the back of your head. How in the world is this supposed to be a group of people all about health? having all of that yeah yeah it's 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 mind numbing and the, the old adage follow the money again it's it's follow the money and again it's it's all designed to generate prescriptions and icd codes and not help 
man, what, what if we just did one thing and you got a money back guarantee? <laughs> Imagine you went to the doctor and got a money back guarantee. Oh, sorry, Mrs. Jones. You know, Mr. Jones didn't survive his quadruple bypass. So we're going to give you, you know, all your money back or, or, you know, something like that or double your money back or, you know, get a vacation somewhere if it doesn't work out. But it doesn't, they're, they're paid for generating these codes and doing these expensive procedures. There's no incentive, there's no incentive for me as somebody who's, who's got health insurance to be healthy, right? The, 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 the Joe six pack smoking the cigarettes, living life dangerously, yeah. It's the same rate that I do and you do. It's not, it's not insurance. It's, it's risk sharing or something. Or, or just like disease management, not just yeah. curing, um, which by the way, guys, if you've ever been to a doctor and you tell them you're on a keto or carnivore or paleo or whatever diet you're doing, they're going to poo poo it because there is no ICD code for getting you to eat more steak. Too bad, because I sure would love to get a subsidy from my health insurance for all the steak and, and other animal foods I buy. <laughs> yeah, what wouldn't that wouldn't that be amazing? That it, would re look that would revolutionize our health. Instead of spending it on procedures and on drugs, make a prescription, take it to your farmer's market. Here is a uh, two hundred dollar voucher to go buy real whole foods from the farmer's market, not just meat, you can get vegetables if you want to, whatever floats your boat, but have that available and then eat this and you'll get healthier and then get some fresh air, go ground, go on a walk, do prescriptive stuff that doesn't cost any money, but then will provide massive benefits to you, which again, impossible in the current model. It, it is, and I don't hold out hope for reformation within within the model itself no. i re i remember when i first got trained in acupuncture 30 years ago they were hot there was a study that just came out showing that people who got regular acupuncture uh were healthier cost the healthcare system less money fewer prescriptions blah 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 and you think no brainer let's let's trial acupuncture and see if it works the the insurance companies are no closer to providing for acupuncture as a treatment than they were 30 years ago. So they're, they're not going to change. Whatever incentives are baked into the system, we're stuck. You know, it's something like some of these failing schools in inner cities. They're just, they're not going to get better. And, you know, I hope we're not getting too political here, but it's, the system's broke. It's flat broke. So what right. we can do, what we can do is similar to what we've done with organic is take our dollars somewhere else. Yes. And so one of the things you need to advocate for is separating out your daily care from emergency medicine. So yes. if you drive a Ferrari, your insurance price should be a little bit higher than if you're driving, a, I don't know, F-150. Whatever. A Yugo. A Yugo. <laughs> nobody, nobody should be driving one of those either. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. But you get my point. So right risk risk but what we've done again is we're, we're we're sharing the price for every single intervention that's done whether it's giving you a band-aid or giving you quadruple bypass and it just it should so if if the state you know if you can get your hands on just emergency medicine insurance and start saving that when you're younger for when you might need it later and yeah. then spend the money on the health club spend the money on good yes. meat spend the money on fish oil you know, all the things you've talked about all these 30 years, you've been talking about this stuff and, and invest it that way. And, and to doctors who can function outside the system or nutritional consultants, that's, you know, that's the other thing. One of my projects, let's back up. First of all, let me pause a second and say, thank you. You helped me start a podcast for people with Lyme disease yes. about six years ago. And I've since retired the podcast. But the name so people can look it up. Yeah, it's called Lyme Ninja Radio. So if you know if somebody with Lyme disease and they can't sleep at night and need something to do, they can listen to 250-some episodes of, of Lyme Ninja Radio. Oh. People people do that. And actually, I still get emails saying, you thank you for having that. It got me through a really tough and dark time. So uh, let me repeat it because you said it fast. Lyme Ninja Radio is yes. the name. 
Dude, dude, you did it a long time. If you made it to 250 episodes, you were committed. Yes. My, my daughter, Aurora, and I cranked those out once a week. wasn't three times a week like you or, or <laughs> five times a week, but yeah, three, four times a week. But we, we tried to keep up, Jimmy. We tried to keep up. Uh, so Sadie had a comment I want to mention. Oh, you have something? Yeah, I, I want to finish that story, but answer Sadie first. She's more important than I am. Uh, well, she, all, all she said, she gave a comment about talking about going to see your doctor. I've been arguing with my primary care physician about keto because she kept saying my cholesterol is high. But then my endocrinologist had to send her a message saying, no, 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 Sadie's cholesterol is just fine. It's so exhausting. And yeah, the patient gets caught in the middle of that yeah. kind of well, uh, hit for tat of, all right, who's right? At, at least you had somebody on the right side. Yeah. Not everybody you. piling on you saying, no, you're the crazy one. Right. So, Thank goodness the endocrinologist had a little bit of knowledge. That's that's actually kind of awesome and hopeful. So one thing after doing the 250-some episodes of Lime Ninja Radio, slow down here, is that it became very clear the problem wasn't any more information, right? The, 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 per, the people with Lyme disease could track down the information they needed on the Internet they can listen to people like me. There are other good websites out there. The problem were the practitioners or the doctors. And so at, because of that, I started another project called Beyond Protocols for doctors, uh, nutritional consultants. We've got one pharmacist in the group to train them how to treat people as individuals, to, to begin to teach them this medicine 2.0, which brings in genetics. Right. Yeah. Which is, you can't get any more personalized than genetics. That's been a game changer. Just in the last decade, this has happened. This is why people are reticent, is it's so new. Of course, we've seen this. You've been around the block much longer than I have. You've seen where you hear about something, you see things, and then like 10, 15, 20 years later, then it becomes more acceptable. Yeah. So we're at the point where it's just now kind of coming on people's radar screen, but they won't embrace it for another five to 10 years. But it is the key to what we're talking about here today, this future of customizing medicine to you and your particular situation. Genetic testing isn't like the totality of health, but it sure does give a lot more clues. Right. And, and the, the danger with all of this is it gets sucked into this broken system. Yes. And gets turned into another magic bullet. So the way that the doctors are looking at genetics right now, they want to keep it simple because they're super busy. They will just want to know, okay, what genetic, it's called a SNP, right? One yeah. little change, right. S-N-P, it's pronounced right. SNP. What one SNP will mean that I need to give them this medicine, this supplement, or not give them that. Very simple. But it's a system. It's this integrated system. It's like there's no magic bullet. There are very few magic bullets. You need to understand what the entire body's doing. What's the family? And this is, this is where the urgent care falls down, and this is where we need these community doctors again. You know, what's the family history? How are the brothers doing, right? You're like your brother's, you know, God rest his soul, his health has a big bearing on where you are right now. What What is your stress, you know? It's, it, are you working as an accountant or are you on Instagram every day having people sending you love letters? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. You're like, what's the daily stress like? What's going on? What are you doing exercise-wise? Are you sitting on your rear end or are you out walking twice? How many miles do you walk now? Uh, I don't really measure it in miles. I just walk for an hour twice a day. Um, so yeah. that's two, three, four miles, something like that. Yeah, yeah long strides. Yeah. I'm six foot three, so I, I do a good clip with long legs. So. <laughs> Keto can be hard. Tabulating, measuring, baking, taking three months to perfect one recipe and to mixed reviews. Did something die in here? Oh, I think it moved. And by that point, you give up your diet, find a dark corner and stuff yourself with sugar, carbs and regret. This uh, isn't what it looks like. Well, this is where Keto Chow saves the day. The easiest, tastiest, ketoist meal replacement on the market. It's like ice cream melted in my mouth. Yes, but melted ice cream with all the protein, nutrients, vitamins, and electrolytes your body needs. Oh, that's cool. And with three starter kits, each with restaurant tips, keto food guides, and a ton of flavors to try, your taste buds and your waistline will thank you. Thank you. 
So grab your starter kit today at jimmylovesketochow.com. It's so easy. Keto Chow. Make keto easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It makes it, all that makes a difference. You can't, but you just went into the urgent care. All they saw were a bunch of numbers and a, a funny looking thing on your leg. And they go down the, the differential diagnosis. Well, it's not bleeding and it, you know, there's no alien head coming out of it. So it must be a blood clot. Go get your ultrasound. Well, to his credit, let, let me back up. To his credit, he said it's highly unlikely, but because of a lot of factors, your age, a lot of factors. It was more of a CYA for himself. Yeah. That if I had not run that, maybe this guy might sue me if it, it, if it does end up as a blood clot. But yeah, I mean, and then huh, this was the other thing that happened during that visit uh, that we haven't talked about that mainstream medicine needs to butt their heads out of. He went to fast shame me. Like, he's yeah. like, well, you're um, obviously of the age when you need to start worrying about that. And with your weight, you really need to da, 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 da. not realizing that I'm busting my ass probably harder than just about most people right now with my statistical protocol. It's intense, all the things that I'm doing on this on this protocol. But it was just immediate judgment of you need to go see a doctor. You're probably going to die and have lots of diseases here in the coming years. I'm like. Because you don't know me, you don't right. know what I'm going through. That's right. And he doesn't, to his defense, he does, and that's the problem. He doesn't know you. And nobody knows you anymore, right? Because it's all hospital-based. You And around here, we're, we're semi-rural. I mean, we've got neighbors who are dairy farmers, but, you know, we got a little city nearby. We're lucky if we can keep a doctor around for a couple years, and there's no continuity of care. The only thing that stays with you is your records, if they can find them. And so, and and the other thing is, you know, I know you had people, health professionals on, on your Instagram live saying, Jimmy, you should get that checked out because it could be a blood. And you did. And you, you did the prudent thing. It's not a blood clot. Thank goodness. You know, thank God it's not a blood clot. So we ruled that out. But that's all the care was good for is to make sure you weren't going to lose a leg or throw a blood clot in the next day. That's all it was good for. It didn't help anything else. There's no other value added. It's just, you know, you're not going to blow out your engine, you know, in the next 24 hours. That's the only information you got out of it. It's not, that's not healthcare. I don't know what that is. That's like death prevention care, but it's not healthcare. And, and I lost about a month's worth of buying ribeye steaks. If I <laughs> <laughs> that sucked, that, that amount of money. And that was with the insurance uh, uh, on that wow. one test, blood clot test, the uh, ultrasound. I looked at the actual like breakdown. The test is like $1,600, and my portion was 600 of that. When I mentioned that to the technician when she was doing that test, uh, I said, man, it was like a $600 test. She went... And I was like, that was with insurance. And she said, no, it's not. She's like, this test is about $400 for my time and what they pay me and what the hospital needs and the test itself and all the everything. She's about $400. And she says, it says $1,600. Yeah, $1,600 as the cost because it goes through this sick care system called the insurance company. And so they jack up the prices. That's why we're all paying through the nose is they're paying highly inflated prices through the healthcare system with insurance. Whereas if I didn't have insurance and I paid out of pocket, the cost she said for me probably would have been about five or $600. So what I ended up paying. Maybe, maybe, but that's, you know, that's the dark side of the insurance game is the, the insurance billing is up there at $1,600. Their reimbursement rate may even be less than the 400 bucks. It. The, the reimbursement rate that they may get back from the insurance company might be 250 And the chiropractors know this. I know chiropractors who stop billing insurance because they'd only get eight or nine bucks back for a visit. And it wasn't worth the time paying somebody to do the billing to get that eight or nine dollars. It costs the money. It's like when the, when the milk prices go below a certain, certain threshold, the farmers around here pour their milk back into the field because it's not worth sending it off. They got to pay the trucking company. It's, it, it's the financial part of this is broken. And don't think if we have single payer fans out there, I got bad news for you. 
that's just going to postpone things and then eventually make things worse because at least now we get to fight with the insurance companies and the government's kind of on your side. When the government's the insurance company and the government, you, you're, you're toast. Well, it, it's just going to be awful. So that's my opinion, but I really think it's not a solution. We, well, we got to create a separate parallel system. Well, single payer will exacerbate all the existing problems we have now because currently what we have is we have this voluminous kind of herd mentality of in, out, in, out, in, out, bill, procedure, and that kind of thing. You don't think that's going to get sped up on warp speed with just a single payer kind of system? You know, look, look at countries uh, where they have that system set up. It's forever to get the care you need, and eat, and it's they really don't have a lot of things beyond the basics. The, the, the basics, exactly. It's, there's no like specialty anymore. You lose all the specialty, which could be a good thing because some of the specialty is the most expensive parts of the uh, medical system. So we've talked a lot about what the problem is, a lot of what medicine 1.0 has been like. Uh, paint the picture, McKay. How do we get to medicine 2.0? How do we get there besides... I guess what's happening now is functional medicine doctors, chiropractors that are nutrition minded, just people that are outside of that system kind of saying, whoa, 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 here's a better way. Are they going to eventually uh, take over and say, hey, look, here's a better way. And then, hey, look at me. Stop going to the doctor. Look at me. Come see me. I, yes. <laughs> but let, so let's put some meat on those bones, though. And so the first step is what you have been doing for all these years, which is encouraging people to take responsibility and control what you can control. I mean, that's, that's step number one, is not thinking of your health. There, there's this idea in Chinese medicine called the Tao, right? And so this amazing philosophical, basically just translates as the path. In other words, there's a right path and a wrong path. There's a healthy path and a non-healthy path. If you walk on the healthy path, chances are, unless a brick falls on your head, you're going to be fairly healthy. Healthy. When we start doing things that aren't healthy, you know, when we get into the, were you a Pepsi drinker or a Coke drinker? Coke. Coke. <laughs> Did you, okay, you're far enough south that it's Coke. So, you know, start drinking Coke. You start drinking the the ding dongs or whatever. I remember your story, whatever that was. For me, right. it was that. For me, it was Diet Coke and peanut M and M's. That was my crack. Did, oh. did, you pour them, did you pour them in there so it would fizz and eat it like that? <laughs> that's a southern thing too, bro. <laughs> well, that's that's my DC boy. I'm too far north for that. And but so we do all these things that are bad for us, and we expect healthcare healthcare to kind of after we've wandered through the briars and the swamp and picked up all the disease that comes along with that healthcare picks us up and just puts us magically back on the road and we're supposed to be shiny and new and clean again but no you have to go back through and undo all that stuff yeah. so if you never wander that far off the path to begin with like if you're keto and you have and healthy and you still have a, you know god forbid a heart attack or something like that you're going to be way better off than somebody's doing all those bad things because right the inflammation is low yes, exactly you're going to recover better you're going to just all the outcomes are going to be better even if it's a adverse reaction none of this guarantees you know lightning's going to not going to strike you it just it doesn't work that way i wish it did but it doesn't although gary taubes once told me he said jimmy None of us are allowed to ever have a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I know. He is, we'll make that deal. Okay, no heart attacks. I Intention. know. Uh, yeah, no, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying there. But, okay. but the, 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 so that's step number one. Take control of what you can control. And then find somebody outside the system. There are lots of more and more, whether it's a chiropractor, whether it's an acupuncturist, whether it's a functional medicine person, get get in with somebody like that and find out the tweaks that you need to kind of help retrace and heal some of those things that have gone wrong yeah. over the years and and recover. And I know that's what you're doing with your hundred days. It's like let's okay, let's let's rewind here and get myself back on track so it can move forward again. Do those things outside. You have somebody outside the system and save the medicine, save the doctor, save the urgent care 
for when you're really stuck and just you, you can't go any further. And then don't be satisfied with what they tell you. Right. And that's where I was going to head next was even if you do go see to see your doctor about a potential, say, thyroid problem, they're going to look at a range of numbers in your thyroid that are based on the people that come to visit doctors, which are usually sick people. And so you might be in a normal range and people are like, oh, I'm OK, or outside the range with like cholesterol, for example, it's outside the range. And so now you're and not realizing that's the range of sick people, whereas a functional medicine kind of doctor and other practitioners, they look at healthy, optimal ranges for what those things are. I always had an idea for a book of doing a book full of what those optimal ranges are for all the tests. The problem is they keep moving the goalposts. They keep coming up with new tests. It would be an outdated book before I would ever get it published. And so that would be the hard part. But maybe a PDF, an ebook, maybe you could do it that way and constantly update it. But yeah, uh, it's it's one of those things that people they want to go see somebody when they have an ailment because we've been entrained to do that, McKay. And right. so how cool would it be if some entrepreneurial type of person said, all right, I'm going to make this clinic and it's going to have this person, which will look at the underlying causes of what's going on. This person that does like acupuncture, for example, which is what you are and helps to deal with some of those things. OK, here's another one that's yeah. more nutrition minded of real food based nutrition, not the what dietitians learn and have kind of this totality of a system that will deal with what's actually causing the problems rather than just covering up with procedures, covering up with uh, medicine, actually fixing the patient like you were saying earlier. Yeah. And, you know, we save money for vacations. We save money for retirement. We save money for that second home we save money for that you know second pickup truck the 1953 cherry red chevy uh that i see driving up the road they said man i'd like to own that truck yeah <laughs> we do all these things but we don't save up for our health we don't and maybe we invest a little bit here or there but we don't we don't expect because we're paying we're paying into the system we expect the system to to take care of us i got bad news for you the system's not going to take care of you. It may pull your behind out of the fire once or twice, but it's not going to help you really get healthy. And they'll, the problem is they pull you out of the fire and they say, oh, you're, you're not on fire anymore. You know, you're, you're good. No, you, all the things, all the illness, all the bad habits that got you into the fire in the first place are still there. They're still, you haven't changed a thing. They just pulled your butt from the fire. One of the major, uh, I guess, breakdowns in the mainstream medicine system is you're on fire long before they see it. Mm, you're smoldering. <laughs> Not just symptomatically. What's but that smell? That's your butt. <laughs> even pathologically, if they're yeah. looking at certain blood markers, this is why that range is so horrible. Because if you're outside the range, then it's noticeable. But if you're in the range, but that range includes disease state. And so if we moved the range outside of the disease state, even if it's subclinical, you're not showing symptoms. Um, you, you don't just wake up one day and have type two diabetes. That is a progress, a long time, allowing your insulin to stay high, allowing your blood sugars to stay high, becoming insulin resistant type of deal. And you should catch it with an A1C. You should catch it with a lot of things, Maybe. but they're not always looking real close. Yeah, it's it's iffy because if it's 5.9, oh, you're okay. No, yeah. you're not okay if you've got a 5.9 A1C. Right. You're on diabetes. Right. If, if, look, I'm so neurotic about it now, McKay. If my blood, uh, if my A1C goes much above 5.0, I'm going, okay, what's wrong? It should be below 5. Point. It was 5.1 the last time I checked. And I'm like, okay, I need to make sure everything's tight. You know, it's cool. But you, you kind of have a little more of a sense of urgency once you understand how your health works. Yeah, if, if you can get the A1C run. I mean, I, I, right? I had this client come in once. She was obese. She had Lyme disease. And I regularly, because of you, I regularly check blood sugar. Even if it's not fasting, I just want to know what their blood sugar is when they come in, then we have a conversation about it. But doctors don't even check blood sugar. So, and she comes in and her blood sugar was 
in, you know, so during the day, 102. Not great, not terrible for, you know, during the day. It's like, okay, you know, and she's obese. She was a big girl. She comes in, her blood sugar's 250. Oh. Exactly. Oh, that's interesting. You know, tell me what was different. Well, I stopped on the way and I got a coffee. Yes. With cream. No yes. sugar. No sugar, though. Coffee with cream and had a kind bar. So yes. the kind bar is honey and nuts, right? But enough to really spike. So we tested her blood sugar 15 minutes later, 250 to 130. 15 minutes after that, it was back down to 97. Hypo. Yep. Well, we, we didn't go after that. But my, my point in this is there's this very small window where her blood sugar was elevated yeah. with about an hour. And that's not going to show up on a fasting blood sugar that may or may not show up on an A1C. Right. It's those are the type of tests that we need to be doing, those challenge tests, those functional tests that actually show what the body's doing. And this is why CGMs are so valuable for a patient now. You can pop it in your arm. That didn't exist in America five years ago. We just now have it. Now, Europe, they've had CGMs for 20 years. So by the time it came to America, it's still very hard to get them. You still have to get a doctor's prescription, which is so stupid. I can go down to the pharmacy right now, buy a traditional blood sugar monitor, but I can't get a blood sugar thing in my arm for a CGM, it just, it, I don't understand why it needs to have a prescription. Follow the money. They, they don't want you, they don't want you testing yourself because you, you, you don't understand. You don't understand the context and you can't generate an ICD code. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's so frustrating, which is why you need to create your parallel health care system before you need it. So in case yeah. you do need it, they can help you recover Again, once, once your bacon's out of the fire, we, we need that emergency room medicine, like you said. And it is, without a doubt, the best in the world. You know, if you're, I'm on a, a state highway here, the ambulances go, especially Friday, Saturday night, people doing things they shouldn't be doing and driving when they shouldn't be driving and getting in a car accident. You know, they get taken up to the, to the Utica hospital and get patched up. And best, you know, even here in the boonies, it's the best in the world. They'll fix you. They'll save your life. Yeah, and people aren't dying of heart attacks anymore. They're dying of heart disease, right? But because there are fewer heart attacks, oh, we're, we're winning the war. Cholesterol's, you know, definitely been a winning formula for us. But no, they're just postponing. They're dying of strokes. They're dying of other things. Yeah. They're just the emergency with the, with the defibrillators everywhere, right? Well, just, it's, and, anyway. And the pet peeve that I have is when they say obesity-related diseases. I hate that phrase with a passion because they assume obesity is the causal factor in those chronic diseases. No, no. Insulin resistance is usually the causal factor in heart disease, diabetes, PCOS, a lot of cancers. You name the chronic disease, it goes back to insulin resistance, which, which does manifest as obesity. But we're blaming the obesity. Obesity-related diseases. Obesity is the uh, fifth leading cause, cause of death, da, 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 da. I'm like, no, no, no. Obesity is a symptom yes. of the bigger problem. And this is why medicine never heals it. We've got cardiologists, we've got diabetologists, we've got this specialist, that specialist, and they're all trying to deal with the exact same disease of insulin resistance. Exactly. And I, I heard you mention that when you interviewed Marty a couple days ago. And man, that is, that is medicine 2.0. They're talking about instead of uh, obesity-related diseases, instead of cardiovascular, insulin-related or inflammation, which essentially you're saying inflammation is the same thing. But but so what type what type of diet's best for you? Well, the diet that lowers your insulin. And I yep. thought, Jimmy, that is genius. But I've got a friend of mine who's really she's world-leading expert in incorporating genomic and nutritional information together. And her, one of her soapboxes is there is no diet that works for everybody. No. And she sees diets. So people will go and read a book and get inspired, whether it's vegan, whether it's carnivore, whether it's keto, whether it's paleo, whether yeah. it's auto-inflammatory, but whatever it happens to be. And if it works for them, 
home run, right? If yes. it doesn't work for them, then they hear stuff like, oh, you're just detoxing right. or just stick with it a little bit longer, whatever, you're having a Herx reaction, all this nonsense where what's happening is their body's actually getting more inflamed. And if they were tracking something like their insulin, they would know yeah. because that would be going in the wrong direction. And the problem is it's hard to track insulin because you have to go see a doctor to get your insulin run. And so at home insulin will change the game totally. And I've talked about that many times, but I'm even becoming McKay. And you know, I've been a low carb guy forever and ever. Amen. I'm not really interested in promoting low carb, paleo, yep. primal, whole 30, keto, carnivore. None of those are interesting to me if they're not the right diet for you. What is interesting to me is are you eating in such a way that you keep your insulin under control? So the low insulin diet, I think, is the winner, winner, chicken dinner here. Uh, and literally chicken dinner might keep your insulin low if you want to. Uh, but like have that as the goal. So if you can get there with paleo, great. If you yeah. can get there with keto, great. If you get there with carnivore, great. I don't care how you do it. Yes, and it's going to be person to person. One person can do paleo. That same person that like that paleo you had earlier that you talked about with the 250 blood sugar, she eats some of the paleo food, she's going to see a 250 again. And so you kind of have to tweak it to your personal thing. And that's where a practitioner, like what we're talking about here, can customize it to your metabolism, your state of insulin resistance, which the study came out, what, three, four years ago, about 88% of the American population and has some level of insulin resistance. And so when we focus on what's, what's the causal factor of all the people having health issues in America, then we can actually do something about not just treating it, not just covering it up, but actually curing it. Right. And that's, that's medicine 2.0. That's yeah. medicine 2.0. Diet used to be easy because you lived in a region and your parents lived in the same region and your grandparents and great grandparents, so forth and so on. You know what to eat because if you didn't eat the right things, guess what? You didn't have children, you didn't reproduce, and just nature took care of things. And then we discovered America, <laughs> and everybody moved, and everybody started moving. And you had Sicilians marrying, marrying the Irish, and the you know the the Native Americans marrying whoever else they were marrying. And now you you took all the genetics and you scrambled eggs. And no, so nobody knows. Nobody knows right now what's even if you have Irish roots like you do, or Italian roots like I do. I've mixed Irish and Italian roots. Maybe for you, okay, we can say you should be eating like an Irishman used to eat. But for me, should I be like an Irishman or an Italian? Which one? I don't know. So you got to figure it out. We didn't used to have to figure it out. You just ate what you ate. You, you'll have a fusion for yours. You have a fusion of Irish. You have like a a potato. Pasta salad. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Actually, I went to Italy, what was it, two years ago, two and a half years ago. They don't eat a lot of pasta or things that, like, Amer like our version of Italian in America, it ain't the real Italian. So, yeah, it was yeah. kind of Pas Pasta's a little side dish. It's a little yeah. side dish, according to my mother. But yeah. not, not in my house. We ate it by the my brothers and I. Just finish out the whole pound. You're going to cook it. Might as well cook it a whole pound. Yes, yes. Right? Uh, that those is, oh. Guys, his name is McKay Rippy. Go check him out. McKay does acupuncture over on Instagram. Uh, he also has McKayRippy.com. M-A-C-K-A-Y-R-I-P-P-E-Y.com. And uh, yeah, dude, it was a long time since I talked to you the last time on my podcast. But I'm so glad I got to see you in person. Gave you a big hug. And I uh, got to have you here today on my show. So thanks for being here. Jimmy, always a pleasure and an honor, too. You are the original gangster of getting this information out there. There you go. Thank you, my friend. Keep up the good work. Thank you, McKay. Get inspiration from the Living La Vida Low Carb Show. Hey, the Living Low Carb Show .com. Woo. Are you tired of playing the mask game? Me, too. That's why I wanted to tell you about the Unmask. This is a breathable, completely breathable. It covers, you can't even see that it's breathable, but it's breathable. Whether you're going on a plane, having to go into a store and wearing this thing, playthemaskgame.com is how you can get this mask. They come in all kinds of colors and everything. In fact, right there, you can see right through it. 
what it is, but when you're wearing it, it does not look like it's anything different, but it's breathable, baby. Playthemassgame.com.